What's up, guys? Welcome to Breaking Walls, Season 2, Episode 2. My name is James Scully. And from here on out, by the way, we're just going to refer to this as Episode 9 of the podcast since we're technically dropping the season format. What we're doing now is releasing podcasts every two weeks on the first Monday of the month or the first day of the month and on the third Monday of the month or the 15th of the month. And today's podcast is with Spencer Johnson. And our topic for discussion is family businesses, do's and don'ts. Spencer and his family run a business called Infinite Cortex Creations. And Spencer and his family recently released their first iOS game app known as Philips Feast. And we're going to get into what Philips Feast is, but basically it's a game where you're a frog. As Spencer calls it, it's Hungry Hungry Hippos in video game format where on this app you're as a frog, you're eating different kinds of bugs to gain points and level up to new levels. And a few quick things. As you know, a couple of weeks ago, we relaunched thewallbreakers.com. And um, if you haven't checked out the site yet, please go ahead and do that. It's different from the previous version of thewallbreakers.com. All of the content that we'll be producing on the Wallbreakers from here on out will be custom content produced under the Wallbreakers header. Now, if you're an artist, who in the past has submitted work to the wall breakers to have it be written about, there's a little change in the format. I don't really want to receive your work and write about it. To me, that's like secondhand information. I want to know from you, straight to the horse's mouth, why you created the work that you did, what was your thought process behind it, what were the emotions that you were feeling from the beginning to the end as you went through, so that you can showcase your thoughts, your ideas, your identity, and tell people how it is that you were feeling when you did something, because we're all very relatable, and you could provide actionable advice to somebody else out there who might be going through something similar in a creative process, regardless of the medium. And as you know, some of the things that have changed on the wall breakers are the kind of content that we'll be producing. So now, twice a month, we're going to have a podcast episode, the first of which will also be our monthly mentor interview. All of our content will be based under a monthly topic that ladders up to a, an event in each month. So this month's major event in February is Valentine's Day, and our topic this month centers around vulnerability, because the way that we figured that out was Valentine's Day's, you know, commercial core is love, but within that is vulnerability because in order to love something or be loved, you have to give unto yourself and therefore be vulnerable. So we want to help people, whether you've been struggling or not, release anxieties that you might have for being vulnerable. So personally for me, this whole month is about vulnerability. I and Lena, we're living this topic as well. You know, we're all people and it's good for me personally to have this journey with you because as the year goes on and the topics change and progress and they will always mirror the events of the month, so therefore it'll basically mirror the rise and fall of a year, our own lives will mirror that in a self-aware idealistic way that can hopefully provide actionable results in your lives and ours as well. So going back a minute, as we said, our monthly topics will create content that we can produce each month. So that is something like these podcast series and our first of the month mentor interview series, which this month is with Chelsea Bonoski. If you haven't watched it, go to thewallbreakers.com. She's fantastic. Or go to the previous episode of this podcast where you can get the audio-only version of the video that we shot. Some of the other topics will include things like Wall breaking weekly challenges where Lena and I talk about some things that we did this month or in the past that we think was influential to us under this topic and we invite you guys to join in. Now obviously if we were just sitting back and talking about it without doing it, you would be less inclined to do so. But because we're joining in, the hope would be that you see this sometimes and think, that's really great. These guys are putting themselves out there. I want to be a part of this. Let me jump in too. And that's all it is. That's all, that's all we're doing. We're also going to be asking people to send in their editorials to get things off their chest that maybe they've been thinking about in terms of vulnerability or things that they've been going through. Remember, we're a collective consciousness, and it's really important for all of us to remember that we are one. And the more unity that we have, the less insecurity, the less fears. And the truth is about this topic, vulnerability, and being comfortable being vulnerable, the term vulnerable doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. You can walk into a room and say hello to somebody that you've never said hello to before. That's a form of vulnerability. But all that was was hello. You know, when you're 
think presently and you try to be in the moment that you're living in right at this moment, like me. Right now I'm sitting here recording an intro to this podcast. The things that you want 10 steps down the road, the things that happened to you five steps ago, they start to get washed away with the ebbs and flows of a tide and you realize that the only thing that matters right at this moment is that the water is brushing up against your feet. And that water is the present tense. So along this present tense line, today's topic is the do's and don'ts of family businesses. Because when you go into business with family or friends, you've got to make sure that you have all the cards on the table all the time because the last thing that you want to do, and this is true of any kind of case, regardless of how well you know somebody going into a situation when you want to get into business with them. But the more open lines of communication that you have, the more successful and potentially fruitful your business is going to be. And Spencer speaks about that in talking about how his relationship working with his family in Infinite Cortex Creations has been. And these are simple things like being responsible, asking for advice, talking to people that you look up to, in this case, each other in a family, making sure that you keep those lines of communication open, no matter how you're feeling at that moment, whether it's joyous or accomplished or angry about something, if you don't express it, it'll never get moved past, and then you are not being present. So that is this week's topic, the do's and don'ts of family or friend businesses featuring Spencer Johnson, and we're going to get to that right after this short interlude. All right, guys, on the podcast today with Spencer Johnson, who is a 3D animator turned app creator for the iOS system, who recently published, along with his family, their first app called Philip's Feast, which is a game where you're a frog, that you have to eat mosquitoes, avoid eating ladybugs and fireflies, and eat regular flies to gain points and level up to new levels. And Spencer runs a company with his family called Infinite Cortex, and I wanted to speak with him today about some of the things that he's learned as far as getting into business with your family or friends and what are some of the do's and don'ts because if you have an emotional connection with somebody before you get into business with them, you have to be very careful that you don't ruin both a business relationship and a personal relationship. And maybe not so much that you have to be very careful, but you should be cognizant of certain things that could really help push your business forward. So I want to welcome Spencer to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's nice to be on the Wall Breakers podcast. As we get into this, I want to ask you, you come from a family with unique intermingled skills. Your parents are computer programmers. Your brothers are designers, illustrators. You have illustration skills. You're a 3D animator. And coming from a family like that, as you were growing up, did your family push you into different forms of art? How did you first discover yourself gravitating towards the art world? What are some of your earliest memories of animation, since that's what you went to college for, but also art and design and other things like that in general? In my childhood, we were always very creative and imaginative, my brothers and I, and and we would draw pictures, make art, you know, make our own little worlds, essentially. And I, I think for the most part, my parents and my mom would just let us, you know, play, you know, it's just like you guys be kids, you know. And art, animation specifically, in high school, I like went to art class and it was kind of my favorite class and would do a lot on the, of that on the side. But I got into computer animation at LAN parties with my friends where I just download free programs and mess around with them. And sometimes I wouldn't be playing games with everyone else. I'd just be making a silly animation. Uh, one of my first 3D animations is actually a mushroom dancing. It was kind of... <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so that, that kind of set me on the path of, as well as really enjoying the cartoons. I mean, I, I just love cartoons. It's just such a fun medium, and you have so much control over things. What were some of your favorite cartoons and animations growing up? I have a distinct memory of watching The Iron Giant with my brother, Josh, and just being like, oh, this this is like the most amazing movie ever <laughs> and it has a mix of 2d and 3d and is just a great it's a great film and now one thing that i and i should clarify to the listeners that spencer and i went to college together and that's how we first became friends 
And it wasn't until years later that I realized, and you can clarify this on the record, actually. You grew up on a farm in Virginia, correct? Yeah, I, I grew up on a farm. I mean, it wasn't a commercial farm. It was more of a, it's a family farm in rural Virginia. It's, it's not as rural as it used to be these days as time passes. I, but it was my grandfather's farm and he gave plots of land to each of his children. And so my I grew up with my uh, aunts and uncles as my neighbors and a very tight-knit, extended family. That's a pretty interesting thing. But also I see parallels there that it makes sense in a way that you would wind up going into business with your family or that you and your family have such synergy of both personal and professional skills being that you spent so much time with each other. Talk to me about your decision to go to Pratt in New York, leaving Virginia. How did that happen? How did you then decide that you were going to pursue animation seriously? And what was the process like? Was it the first time that you went to New York? You know, how much time had you spent in New York prior to moving from rural Virginia to one of the largest metropolitan areas in the entire world? I'd gone to New York once before. We went there for a family vacation. I think it was 4th of July or some holiday where we actually stayed in New Jersey and took the train over. And the most I can remember from that vacation, I was very, I wasn't, I was very young. I was probably eight or 10, I want to say. The most I can remember from that vacation is I got really sick and being sick <laughs> as a little kid in the subway is like not the greatest of experiences, but it was it was still fun for me. Then to go to Pratt, I kind of I I looked up a series of schools that kind of had good animation programs, and Pratt was on that list. And then visited a couple of them, and Pratt really had the nicest campus. They put a lot they of money. Have, yeah, yeah, they have a beautiful campus. They definitely uh, put a lot of money into the visual <laughs> when you go there. Yeah, so uh, that kind of drove my decision mostly, and and just because it was it was New York, you know. Came yeah, absolutely. New York. Did you come in as an animation major? Because we didn't have to select majors until at the end of freshman year. Because of those of you who don't know, Pratt does a foundation program for all majors that aren't architecture and fashion, where every major that you're going to go into is lumped together in a series of foundation courses like sculpture. Uh, well, which would be three-dimensional design, drawing, light color design, and you learn these base foundation set of skills, and then starting in sophomore year, you branch off into your major and that core curriculum. So were you an animation major from day one? Yeah, I was already keyed in on, on animation. I was kind of set, set on my path, and I, I tended towards 3D over 2D, although I did take a lot of the 2D classes, mostly because 3D was my focus, and I saw it as having more opportunities. And at the time, yes, and that's one thing we should clarify is that there was an animation major and then there was a 3D. Computer graphics and computer interactive graphics. media was its name at the time. I think it's named something else right now. I don't know. And But there was a lot of crossover in between classes. So you would spend time with people in, in the traditional animation major as well, correct? Yeah. Character animation was what I was after. And you can learn that with puppets, with clay models, with ever you know. And we, I did sand animation, one of the animation classes, and it's all about bringing a character to life, whether it's a 3D one or a 2D one. Or yeah, absolutely. Now, what would you tell me? And this is interesting that you're in business with your family, and I've known you as somebody who's intelligent, headstrong at times. <laughs> and doesn't enjoy dealing with politics in the sense that I know you as somebody who understands how to get from point A to point B, and that's a good thing. And when people deviate from that for reasons that are not clear or don't make any sense, you're somebody who probably like myself tends to balk at that. What did you learn from dealing with politics in a college setting that you've then taken with you to your professional career? You got to always keep things professional and realize that sometimes, you know, it doesn't, it's not necessarily going to go your way. And there's probably usually better ways to make it go your way. Yeah, absolutely. Your reaction, you know, there's always that, you always got to take that moment of pause, it seems. And that's a good thing, you know, for people to realize. And I think you only, 
it's like sticking your finger in a socket as a toddler. Once you do that and you're like, no, that really hurt, you start to figure out like, oh, yeah, from those times that I burned myself because while I was right, yeah, it didn't matter in the end that I was right. You know, you do kind of learn to step back and breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 I think with my family, it's 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 easier because there's, there's less politics and there's more of a unified goal. And my goal, you know, wasn't necessarily anything specific. You know, some people fall in love with projects a desired outcome or a vision and they want to have control over all of it and you know they have to have it their way and yeah a lot of times that can be detrimental and that that's what can kind of lead to overreactions or for particularly in for our family business infinite cortex especially this first project i wanted to be very loose it was just you know mostly about learning and accomplishing something you know that something didn't didn't have to be a, a magnum opus. It just it just needed to get done eventually, Absolutely. and it and and be fun, you know. And it, if it had to be something, it had to be fun. And so I, I you know, made a lot of compromises in some areas. Also tried to get what I wanted in in other areas. But I'm really happy with our first product, Philips Feast. Philips Feast is a is a fantastic piece of gaming that I've spent a lot of hours playing <laughs> in a few weeks since it's been released. I'm noticing a a positive linear pattern here growing up in your family. That your parents, while well, they gave you structure, they allowed you and your brother is a lot of room to play and figure things out on your own. You also, like we said earlier, come from a family that has synergetic yet unique skill sets that would lend itself to a family business. You have computer programming, you have animation skills, you have design skills, and when you put these things together, combined with the ease of business and personal relationships that you have with each other because you're family and close, it makes sense that you guys would wind up at some point forming some sort of professional partnership. And I want you to talk to me about how that came to be. The business was officially formed on April 1st. It wasn't an, an April Fool's in 2012. And uh, yeah, my my family has a lot of talents and this business has been a sort of part-time project for a lot of us and some, some of that time and then full-time for other times, depending how much other professional work we have to do. Mm -hmm. So it's nice when you have a lot of talents between each other and not necessarily a lot of times because we would you know we, it was easy to shift responsibilities between each other like at one point I wasn't doing any of the art on the project I, I was more just giving comments because I didn't have the time and I was trying to learn the program and then at another point I had to take over a lot of their art because my brother's Weren't, weren't able to do as much of the, the sprite art because they didn't have as much time. And they, with, there were some other responsibilities in the business that we wanted them to focus on, including they, their, my brothers are also excellent musicians, so they contribute the soundtrack to the game itself as well. So two things that are quickly becoming apparent are if you want to go into business with anybody, regardless of how well you know them at the onset of going into business, but particularly when you have a personal relationship with the people to begin with, Compromise and open lines of communication are two incredibly important, easily overstated things that you need to be in business with somebody. You have to have two or more people willing to work and then also willing to say, oh, I, I can fill in this blank here. I can't fill in this blank. Can you do this? And there has to be, uh, and that that creates synergy in that regard as well because you develop even more trust for somebody like, oh, yes, you can take on this art. I trust that you'll get it done. I trust it'll be good and then I can pick it up in two weeks or something. Um, yeah. And now one thing that I know that your family does is that every Sunday, since you formed this company in, it's going on three years now, you have a meeting. And sometimes the meetings are shorter than others, but you go over you know, the state of affairs, you go over next steps. And I think, especially with family, it would be very easy to, ah, well, we don't have to have this meeting this week. <laughs> you know, well, well, we'll talk next week. And But you guys have, other than like when maybe a Christmas is on a Sunday or something, you'll reschedule, but you have been very good about keeping that meeting in place and making sure that you're constantly pushing infinite cortex forward. And I think that's incredibly important. I think you would agree with that, but tell me how that has helped the business. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about meetings, most people are like, oh, roll their eyes. Cause it seems like a lot of people's times is taken up by too many meetings. But our business, my family's business, Infinite Cortex, we, we have, as you said, a meeting every Sunday. 
And it's it's more, you know, just, oh, we got to keep check in, keep up, see what's being done. You know, it's, it's also our time for a review. What progress has been made? Oh, does this look right? Does, can this look better? Uh, what do people think of this? And it's been a really probably the number one driving factor. And as you said, get, keeping the business going forward because it's it's actually been nice as a family because yeah, exactly. we're in four different states from I, my brother's in Boston. I was in New York and now in Florida. My mother and father are in Virginia and my oldest brother is in uh, San Francisco. So like we're across the <laughs> spread. So to have this online meeting, uh, we use Google chat and go over what we've accomplished and what we need to accomplish is just a really nice point of contact. And Absolutely. And that's a good way to put it, point of contact. Aside from the fact that it's needed to push the business forward in a regimented sense that you go over what needs to be done, what can be done, what's what's going on. There's also that open line of communication where if you, Spencer, are feeling something like, hey, Hey Joshua, like I, I think that we got to do this. There's a point in time that you and him and the rest of your family are going to communicate with each other, and compromise can be made. Things will move forward on both a physical perspective, but also an emotional perspective. Where let's say you are feeling frustrated with something, the grievances get aired out. It's all under the family roof, Godfather style, and uh, <laughs> and then you guys move forward. And and, it, and it's it's important. And you know, like you're saying, people hate meetings. Because there are lots of meetings in businesses that just seem frivolous and, you know, you've got hard deadlines to meet and, and meetings are taking away from the time that I need to sit and work on this. And I'm not directly involved in this meeting, but I'm in it somehow at the same time. Yeah. But, when a, but a meeting is very important when it's clear, concise. It's not constantly going on. It's once a week. So you guys have plenty of time to, to work on the rest of your life. And to me, that seems like such an easily, again, overstated little bit of patient, but at the same time is really a linchpin to your business. Without that meeting once a week, there probably would be no business. Yeah, and it, it, gives, it keeps it legit. And I think I can probably count on one hand times where we had to basically no one could make it. And as you said, it's mostly holiday related or travels for holidays. And even then, we, we've had people tune in from coffee shops, from an iPad on the road to a tethered phone to just kind of sit down. And it's nice because when you're working alone, you can get stuck in a void. You can even settle like, oh, that's good enough. But when you, you have somebody you can bounce stuff off every week, yeah, you, exactly. It kind of pushes you to be like, oh, you know, that, I guess that wasn't good enough. I'll go back and make those tweaks and make everything better, you know? Yeah. And plus when it's, you know, your father talking to you about it and he's somebody that from a personal level you look up to, if he's like, hey, I think maybe we can do this. You're, I'm, I'm sure that most of the time in your own mind, you're not going to go, bah, yeah, whatever. You're, you're going <laughs> to listen to what he has to say because there's a level of trust and understanding and camaraderie yeah. there. Because it's only once a week, like you're saying, you'll have family members tune in from coffee shops. If you miss that meeting that week, you're going to spend the rest of the week playing catch up and trying to figure out what was discussed. And we're yeah. talking now almost three years, so it's it's 120 something meetings, you know, because that's how many weeks have, there have been. And your life and your the rest of your family's life has evolved continuously in that time. But there's that constant each week that keeps that line of communication open and allowed you guys to work on a game and release it over. And and as a friend of yours, I, I've stood by and seen this progression happen. Yeah. And I mean, never did I think like, no, they're just going to fall apart at some point. I never <laughs> felt that at all. But as an outsider, it's always fun to be able to look back and go, oh, wow, you know, it has been since April 1st, 2012. Time has gone on and accomplishments have been made. Yeah. So your first accomplishment as a family uh, in the iOS gaming world, and it's only available for Mac OS. Yeah. Current, currently, our, our, we've only released on iOS. Uh, at one point, we were looking at doing different platforms for Android. We decided that iOS was simple and it kept things neat. Android has a lot of different products, so it means a lot of different screen resolutions, a lot of different OSs. It's a lot, it's a lot more IT to deal with. And as a small company, mostly working part-time, we decided to you know, keep it simple. Take me through how you came to concept Philips Feast. And a lot of it was your conception, correct? And how did this come to be as a game? You know, you formed the company, then what? You know, so where did, where did this come from? Well, the concept for Philips Feast actually began before the company was formed. It was kind of our rallying project, which was, I, I'd 
wanted to learn essentially mobile game design. So I wanted to come up with an easy to build game that would be fun. And I could go through the process of figuring out how exactly you do all these steps. Right. There's a lot of easy games out there, like uh, Flappy Birds that are can be extremely successful. Angry Birds or, you know, the, the Infinite Runners and Jetpack Joyride. I mean, there's there's not a lot to them. And, so, and, and there's actually other frog eat bug games out there, but Phillips Feast is the best. It's supposed to be just a simple point game, simple interaction, you know, not a lot. It's supposed to be the kind of game where you can sit down with a friend and you know, go back and forth and see who can get the high score. The main driving thing was simplicity to yet fun. You right. know, don't make it too complicated and try to make it fun. From your words, I, and I did describe it at the onset, but I want you to describe it again. What is the gameplay of Philip's Feast? What is the object? You play as Philip the Frog in his swamp, and your goal is to eat bugs. It's essentially hungry, hungry hippos. Mm -hmm. And there's some there's some obstacles to your eating bugs in that you get hurt if you eat a poisonous bug. And I read online, I'm not sure the validity of everything you read online, but uh, ladybugs and fireflies were poisonous to frogs and that gotcha. they, they couldn't eat them. So that was kind of my motivation for, okay, well, we'll have these some bugs that, you know, will hurt you if you eat them. And then the other obstacle is the mosquitoes, which are common in any swamp and the bane of most everyone's existence, I believe. And so the mosquitoes will basically hunt you and you kind of have to defend yourself with your tongue. So it kind of becomes a missile command frog command like game in that aspect right there's a catch-22 there also because eat the firefly or if you eat the ladybug you get a lot of points but you lose the most life yeah and what people don't realize is that you don't have to eat flies you, you really can just spend the entire time trying to eat the mosquitoes before they sting you but if you eat the flies it helps your life you gain points you know so it really there there it's multi-layered yet simple all at the same time. There's a couple of risk first rewards built in in that the flies are worth a good amount of points and give you the most amount of life and the mosquitoes aren't worth that many points but they're going to hurt you so you got to stop them. And then as you said the ladybugs will give you a lot of points but they're going to hurt you so you can only eat so many of them before you die. Right, and they actually hurt you more than getting stung by a mosquito, an individual mosquito bite. In the early levels, yeah. The mosquitoes actually scale, damage scales with the level. Oh, interesting. Which is, which is and so there, there is no real... Yeah, yeah there's no real end, end right, to the game. There's no win condition. It's it's kind of a roguelike game in that as fat as Philip can become in the at any point in the game, at, at some point he's going to... Poor perish. Philip will die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you do, Philip's going to die at some point. It's kind it's of a bad. bleak how many he's taking out with him before he yeah. goes. So it's all about how many points you can score before he, he suffers that final mosquito bite. Now take me through what the process was for giving up who was doing what for the game. You know, you at the onset or shortly before that made the decision that you were going to learn game development language. And your parents have you know, programming abilities coming in and you're an animator and you're, take me through how things were divvied up as far as tasks went. You said that sometimes people would hand things off to each other. As far as taking this game from conception to now release, how did the process go? What were the biggest hiccups that you had to learn from? What were the biggest successes along the way? Well, it started out with, like you said, I, I was, going to do some of the programming. So basically, my father has a programming background. So him and I kind of split. We were the, the dev team. We kind of split the work. And we would have occasional weekly meetings where we kind of review and we'd set out uh, sprints in an, in an agile development scenario of things we needed to accomplish. Then I did some of the art, but at first, most of the art was handled by my two brothers, Josh and Daniel, where they and they kind of divvied up the tasks. So my one one brother, Josh, he, he handled painting the backgrounds, 
which we kind of have this this scrolling background and we were actually playing a, a, a more massive scroll of, of three frames instead of what we have two so we got room to expand there um and then my and he handled the backgrounds in the, in the initial frog and then my other brother did all the bug sprites and then so we kind of started there and i was mostly programming gameplay which meant oh it started out with the bug ai mm -hmm. so i programmed all, all the behavior of the bugs and then my dad did a lot of the the technical handling of the different scenes and views and the transitions from the menu screen to the play screen and then he moved on to hand on the frog. So he started initially with the frog and how he grows in size and um, how he gets thinner and then how he his, his tongue works. Cause it's, it's it, was, it was kind of challenging to get the tongue to fly out and then return. And so that was kind of probably one of our first hurdles. He, well, he was working on that. I was working on, the behavior of the bugs, which had their own hurdles, um, but weren't that complicated because I had done a similar, similar in, in one of my first prototypes. So once we got gameplay down, then we had to iron out some visual stuff. The bugs, for the most part, stayed the same, although I think we had an early, early change on them, uh, where their their legs were kind of more chaotic and it was it was a little distracting. Then later on, uh, once I was kind of freed up from my day job, and my other brothers were taken over, I moved on to expand the art on the frog because I felt they looked kind of flat, and I wanted to give him a little bit more emotion. Mm -hmm. He's very stoic, and you know <laughs> he doesn't have a lot of emotion now, but. I just I just gave him a kind of a smiley face and a frowny face that he transitions to depending on the situation. Yeah. To kind of give him again, it comes back to giving him a little bit of character, you know. Exactly. I mean, Philip is a hungry dude. Yeah. And I have noticed also, you know, when I fatten him up, he's got a his his eyes are a little squinty, and he gets a big smile on his face. He's yeah. satisfied. <laughs> And yeah, so, I actually rem I remember the previous Philip design too, and thinking that you know people tend to uh, aggregate towards animals and other creatures that resemble people in their emotions. So yeah. it's always good to give a, a character some character. Yeah, because it, it gives a connection to the player to kind of share in his success and his doom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we hit, let's say, the summer of 2014 and, and we're moving closer to when you release the app at the end of the year, what were some of the final little bits and pieces that you put onto the app itself that you feel took it over the top? Like trophies, you added a lot of different trophies that people can... Uh, oh, yeah. Get. My favorite is the skewer, which is when you eat six bugs at one time. <laughs> you know, little animation screens. Yeah, we always had a goal of having achievements, or at least it was one of our desired things. It so adds a level of uh, interactivity with, with players. And so, yeah, again, those in, which required a little couple technical challenges, or, as well as additional art assets to really sell them with uh, connecting it to Game Center and, and Apple's high score lists. And yeah, I, I had a little bit of polish, more motion graphics -y start to the game. So it wasn't just kind of static, which I think helps in a couple other polishes. Like when you're super fat, when Philip is really full on bugs, he starts to glow because he can't get any fatter. So mm -hmm. I wanted to add this additional like or of radiance tell to the player, you know, he's doing good. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Yeah, initially when my brother Daniel started doing all the menus and the, the UI stuff, which was kind of one of the last things after we had gameplay and everything working, we were, working, we were trying to implement the achievements, we still needed a whole bunch of UI, so it just wasn't standard default screens. So I took his initial design, which was kind of these these boards hanging from chains, and had to you know follow along with that to expand it to all the different buttons and menus we needed. So it's kind of a it's it's one of those challenges where you need to you need to take someone's initial design and style and then replicate it yourself to keep everything consistent. Mm -hmm. So with the release of Philips Feast, you guys as a family, you know, like your brother designed the music for the game. So 
this is truly a family business in the sense that there was no one from the outside that did anything for this creation of this game. You guys yeah, created it. You guys testing. released it. I'm sorry? Other than play testing. We, right. We didn't... Sure. But that yeah. that's necessary. But yeah. I, I, as far as the creation of the game itself, your family is truly a foundry in this regard for the creation of, of this app. You, you have yeah. done everything for it under the one roof. The foundry, the factory, the... So now that Philip's Feast has been released, what's next for Infinite Cortex? What's next for you personally? What are some of your biggest takeaways that you've learned from being in business with your family that you didn't have in your personal arsenal before April 1st, 2012? We're planning, well, an update for Philip, expand a little bit of content and fix a couple of bugs that made it through. Not the bugs you eat, but programming errors or... <laughs> game errors. What I learned was it's, I mean, I've collaborated with people before, but it's it's a really fun process. And it's it's nice to have reliable people whose talents you can tap into. And, and like, like we've been saying, when you need to hand something off because you don't have time to get it done, even though, you know, you want to because you want to work as hard as possible and you, you don't want to feel like you're, you're dropping the ball, but sometimes time doesn't allow that. So you got to you got to hand stuff off and it's nice to have reliable talents and a, a range of talents to be able to tap into and get ex get out exactly what you kind of need. What would be some things that if somebody out there listening was looking to start a business with family or friends, what are some things that you would recommend to them that they absolutely adhere to that might even be more important because you have a personal relationship with these people go before you get into business with them? What are some things that you would say absolutely do this for the success of the business from both a personal and a professional standpoint? I'd say keep it light and have fun. You know, don't don't take things too seriously. Don't get balled up in anything petty, you know, that kind of goes for life in general. But And kind of have a goal and have people you know you can collaborate and reach out to talents that you don't necessarily have or that somebody can fill in for you, you know? Yeah. Don't try to do everything on your own. You have to rely on others. There's a collective consciousness there that, especially yeah. in a family business, you're employing. And I think we could see the results of that as well, uh, specifically a collective consciousness. You have five people that are emotionally connected with each other, who trust each other's skills, who have skills that are in line with each other. And I don't recall, any, <laughs> and if your family's listening, Spencer and I spent a lot of time hanging out and he never came over. He was like, bye. I just I can't stand any of this anymore. <laughs> never heard, it was none of that that happened. So that and that could happen, you know. And there was none. Of, there was none of that, you know. You guys truly are working like a well-oiled machine, and it's mostly because of communication, because you're having fun, because you're not necessarily setting unrealistic expectations for any of this, and that's how yeah. you grow, you know. Yeah, I think we had a good plan going in and a good plan going forward, you know. I think that's that's another thing. You kind of have to lay out your goals, and you can be you can be a little lenient in, in how long you want to accomplish them, but you can still need to be able to kind of have that schedule of getting something done by a certain amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe, like we said about the meeting earlier, maybe with your family, there might be more of a tendency to be more lenient and just push things off because yeah. it's not like your boss, you know, it, it's a little different, but it's it's all the more important then to have those checks and balances put in place. I guess the nice part about a family is it's, it's less like, oh, I'm going to have to work late. It's more like, oh, I don't want to disappoint my family because I, I have such a strong emotional connection to them. Yeah, absolutely. Truthfully, when there's passion and strong emotional connections, the end product is almost always going to be better in the end, you know? Yeah, exactly. What you mentioned, you know, you have a good plan put in place for going forward. What's next? Well, next, we, we have another product that we've been working alongside with Philip's Feast, which is a, a children's book, Galini's Birthday Gift. So we're going to finish that up and try to get that released on different digital book outlets, essentially, and maybe a couple of hard copies, depending. As well as we're going to, again, we have a already update plan for Philip, hopefully in this this month, we should have at least one update by the end of this month, which is nice because we kind of, you know, we want to keep Philip running along, you know, mm -hmm. it's not something where we're just, we just released it out into the wild and let him survive, although that's kind of what the game is about. And along that lines, we'll also 
trying to come up with additional content, maybe adding additional bugs, additional uh, high scores, leaderboards, essentially, different in-app purchases like a mosquito repellent or a bug zapper or uh, some sort of uh, life rejuvenation, let people buy favors, I guess, or, or, or have a means to earn some sort of in-app currency to be able to buy them without having to spend real money. But we haven't ironed all those out yet. We're still we're still kind of brainstorming some some ideas and as well as we're trying to come up with another game or app to start working on alongside Philip to kind of keep products rolling out of our, our foundry. Yeah. Well it definitely sounds like you guys one have a lot on your plate, but also that you have a clear point of attack. You can do things one step at a time and not get too ahead of yourself. And so that the same feelings that brought you to this point continue going forward, both, you know, emotionally and professionally otherwise. Yeah. So yeah, it's important to take one, one step at a time because then, you know, you got to bite off what you can chew and then eventually you'll be able to eat the elephant. Uh, Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Always, you know, the, usually the next step is pretty clear. And if you worry about 15 steps down the road, you're just going to implode because there's no way to know that. You know, you can yeah. only do what, what you know you have to do. So if people want to download Philip's Feast, the first thing they're going to have to know is that the host of this podcast, <laughs> yours truly, is currently the high score holder. So come take your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> but if people, if people want to download, if people have a, an, an iPad or they have a, an iPhone, and they want to download Philip's Feast. So the easiest way is probably to go to iTunes and search Philip's Feast, F-I-L-L-I-P, apostrophe S, F-E-A-S-T. Mm-hmm. Or you can go to our website, www.infinitecortex.com, and there's a, a Philip's Feast link at the top, and there should be a download link there. And people should know that this game is free. It does not cost free download. Anything. Yeah, it free doesn't download. cost download. We have ads running in the, the bottom, a banner ad at the bottom, but it's not it's not very intrusive. It's just there so we can get a trickle of revenue. I, and that's never been the uh, the point of it. The point is always to fatten up on some dead mosquitoes and flies. That's always <laughs> been the point of this. Philip is one hungry dude. Yeah. The point is to keep him as fat as possible for as yep. long as possible. And in a world that's going the other way, it's nice to see that there's some good old gluttony around. <laughs> Do you have anything that you want to plug personally outside of the failing business? Oh, uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Maroon Facelift. And that's M-A-R-O-O-N. F-A-C-L-I-F-T. That's probably uh, the biggest one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any last notes that you want to say to the world about Infinite's Cortex or about Philip's Feast itself? Keep on breaking those walls. Keep yeah. Wall breakers. All right. Well, thank you very much, Spencer. Thanks, James. Okay. So that was my conversation with Spencer Johnson about his family business, Infinite Cortex Creations. And if you want to download Philips Feast, that's F-I-L-L-I-P, you can do so by picking up your iPad or your iPhone, going to the App Store, and downloading Philips Feast today. But once again, I must warn you, if you're going to do so, you got to come looking for my head because the guy sitting here recording this right now is the number one score holder on Philips Feast. So I'll tell you what, come take your best shot. That's some vulnerability right there for you. But anyway... In all seriousness, that was a fantastic interview with Spencer. I really appreciate him taking the time out of his schedule while in sunny, wintered Florida to speak with me. Spencer is somebody that I wanted to have on the podcast in season one, back when we were doing a season format, but he was still working through the logistics of getting Phillips Feast out into the world. And it was important to he and myself to wait until this app was released because then we could have a nice cap on a conversation and a move forward. So... At this exact moment, Spencer and his family are preparing the next release of updates for Philip, and they're working on those new projects that he mentioned. Another place that you can go to for information on Philip's Feast and Galini's Gift is blog.infinitecortex.com. That's I-N-F-I-N-I-T-E-C-O-R-T-E-X.com, blog.infinitecortex. I want to thank you guys, like I always do, for tuning in out there in listening land to 
Breaking Walls. This is episode nine of the podcast. I'm excited to be doing these more regularly, and one of the reasons why I didn't want to commit to a weekly podcast and do them in a season format originally was that I didn't want it to become a chore to me and lose the whole process and the point of doing it. But truthfully, when you're only doing two a month, it's pretty easy to keep things fresh and to discover new topics of conversation and new people that deserve to be on the podcast. I think this is going to be a very successful year for thewallbreakers.com and for Breaking Walls, the podcast. The journey that it was for me to release this podcast last year, leave New York, not know what I was doing with myself, figure all that out on the fly and come back to New York, never knowing that that's exactly what was going to happen. And yes, I am back in New York. It's one that I would like to say that I like rewriting my life on the fly. And that's a good thing. You can't sit down all the time and try to figure things out. Sometimes you've got to move and kind of roll with punches and you learn more about yourself that way and, and you feel more accomplished. And I feel good. And that's part of the reason why I feel so good about this coming up year for the Wall Breakers, but also because Lena Gonzalez is amazing and she's on board. And her and I sat down and we really mapped out this community from scratch for six months. And that is not to, like I always say, put down the previous incarnation of the Wall Breakers, but sometimes things need a facelift and the tenants that were in place were good, but you just have to execute them in new ways. So as always, if you're looking to submit some form of writing, some form of art to me at The Wall Breakers, you can do so by emailing Lena or myself at hello at thewallbreakers.com. And if you want to submit art, I'm going to have a conversation with you about writing a piece for yourself and I will publish it rather than me writing it about you and then checking in and asking you what you think of the article. I want things to be from your voice because this community needs multiple voices. It can't just be everything flowing through Lena and myself because then things have a very similar tone to them after a while because it's always coming from my point of view. I want this community to be from everybody's point of view. In two weeks we'll have a very special guest on this podcast. It'll be our March mentor interview who shall remain unnamed until the day comes. But I can tell you that it'll be a great one and uh, and I will also be telling you about the topic of conversation for March when March rolls around. But until then, we have vulnerabilities that we need to address. And that's why February is the month of vulnerability. We're in mid-month now. I hope that you guys are getting ready for spring. I hope that you guys are pushing yourselves forward. Hug somebody you love. You know, do those things that are going to make you feel good about life. If you've been feeling down, reach out to somebody you care about. Hell, reach out to me if you want. I will do my best to point you in the right direction. That is part of my job here. And you know how I always end these things. I want you to keep getting out there. I want you to look at the world around you. Look at the positives. Don't look at the negatives, even if it's really hard sometimes, because a negative frame of mind only continues down one path, and a positive one over time becomes the only worthwhile frame of mind. So get out there, do what you gotta do, earn that money because unfortunately they keep sending those gimmicks in the mail called bills, but do it with a smile and with a plan in place and keep breaking those walls, guys. My name is James Scully. This has been Breaking Walls, episode 9, and until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you.